Hello, good evening, welcome. Wonderful to see you all here for this very special Sydney Ideas event. It is the 2022 Michael Hintz Lecture with Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert, Hostage Diplomacy, Who's in Control? And it's presented in partnership with the Centre for International Security Studies. My name is Fenella Kernerbone. I'm the head of programming for Sydney Ideas, and it's a, a wonderful thing to have you joining us here in the room. And of course, for those of you who are joining us online too, welcome, uh, welcome to you. Uh, tonight, we're so pleased to welcome you, uh, Kylie Moore Gilbert, um, academic, to speak to us to highlight the complex nature of state hostage taking and the ways that Australia's approach can be refined to tackle what is a growing and global problem. And I know Kylie's going to talk to us about this. Um, but before we continue, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, to water and to culture. The University of Sydney is on the land of the Gadigal people and I pay my respects to Elders past and present. We are on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and we acknowledge that this land has never been ceded. I also further acknowledge the traditional custodians of country where you might live, where you might work, where you might share ideas here in the room and of course at home as well and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and also extend that respect to any members of First Nations communities who might be here today. After the talk tonight, uh, Professor Sarah Phillips is going to be in conversation with Kylie Moore Gilbert, which we're really excited about. And in that moment, we're going to open it up to your questions as well. If you would like to ask a question in the room, uh, you can use slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, use the code Sydney Ideas. If you're watching online, you can just uh, minimise your video if it's on full screen and you'll see the Slido um, box just underneath. So you can ask your question directly into the screen that you're looking in now. And again, uh, but if you do need to go to slido.com, it's uh, Sydney IDs. We also have two roving microphones, so uh, please put up your hand when that comes and you can, um, you can ask a question that way too. Uh, and to join the conversation on Twitter, hashtag Sydney IDs. So it's now my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Professor James Dedarian, who is the Director of the Centre for International Security Studies. He's the Michael Hintz Chair. We're here tonight for the Michael Hintz Lecture, and what a delight it is to welcome him to the stage to offer some background to tonight's event. Would you please welcome James? Thank you, Fanella, very much, and thank you, Sydney Ideas, for keeping the intellectual life of Sydney vibrant. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. I mean, to see people in an auditorium again after the long pandemic interlude is something very, very um, special and heartwarming. So we appreciate it. We very much appreciate it. And we're here today, um, thanks to a generous gift from uh, Sir Michael Hintza and Lady Dorothy Hintza. The gift was intended to set up the Center for International Security Studies in 2006, and it is partially uh, geared towards research, teaching, but something like this, public engagement, um, getting ideas out there, getting ideas back. So this is a very special occasion, an annual event. It's been on a hiatus, and now we're back, and uh, we're thrilled to be back with uh, a remarkable speaker. I'm, I'm just going to say a, a word or two about the topic. We're all here to hear about hostage diplomacy. This might be a new term for some of you, but um, it has an, an old history. It goes back to antiquity. Uh, for a very long time, you know, warring parties exchanged hostages to keep the peace. You know, in classical Greece, many of you have seen the Godfather film. You know, to when you wanted to negotiate, you exchanged hostages. Um, but it's changed. So it's been globalized, and as we've seen recently, it's been personalized. And um, we're here to, to hear about that because nation states have to reckon with this now in a way, because it's become a tool uh, of the weak against the strong, an asymmetrical tool. Um, it's been globalized, and as we're going to hear today from our speaker, it's been personalized. And, and um, it's something that we, you know, why we invited our speaker today is because we feel that this is something that's not going to go away. It's because of the incredible courage of Kali and the resilience, of course, that we invite her to speak, but it's because she's taken it on as a cause to, to educate, but also to begin a, a advocacy to, to those people who don't get heard. Um, there's a lot of people out there right now who are sitting in jails who don't get heard, and um, that's why we chose Kylie, and, and we're very appreciative to have you here today. I also just wanted to say that we're very fortunate to have with us 
Dr. Sarah Phillips. She's one of our own from CIS. She's an expert on uh, in Af African politics and, and Northern Africa and the Middle East. Just came back from the region. Uh, does a lot of field research on this. And um, we're honored to have her introduce our speaker. And we're honored to have her, of course, to moderate, after which there will be a Q&A session. So thank you once again for all coming. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the event. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about hostage diplomacy and uh, to hearing um, you all respond to this in the Q&A period. So thank you very much. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, James, and thank you all for coming. It is just really nice to be here for a live event. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you. Um, and, it's, and it's so nice to be able to do it with this lady right here. In 2018, as I'm sure many of you know, Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert was falsely accused and charged of espionage and imprisoned in Iran for over two years. Before she was released in a prisoner exchange deal that was negotiated by the Australian government. As a victim of hostage diplomacy, Dr. Moore Gilbert experienced firsthand the injustice of being reduced to little more than a political bargaining chip. And I'm sure that some of you have probably already read her wonderful book, The Uncaged Sky. If you have not, I highly recommend it to you. It is also available in audiobook, which Kylie reads just perfectly. But to those of you who haven't, I can really recommend it to you, I mean, for many reasons, but not least of which is the nuance with which she portrays the Iranian political system and the place in which prisons play within that system. It's also, I think, striking for its portrayal of her captors as part of wider systems of power. Um, but equally as sometimes capable of exercising agency within those systems of power. And I think that as we watch the events that are unfolding now in Iran, as protesters demand change after the brutal death of Mahsa Amini while in custody of the Guidance Patrol, which is also, also known as the, uh, the Morality P uh, Police, Kylie's book, I think, is a testament to the savvy and the courage of Iranian women. And throughout the book, you're introduced to her fellow prisoners, many of whom help her and they help each other to navigate the prison system, sustaining each other with practical advice, with solidarity and with the gift of hope. And in her ongoing advocacy for those incarcerated in Iran's political prisons and for those who are imprisoned elsewhere as well, Dr. Moore Gilbert again displays a very nuanced understanding of the deeper international politics that are at play here, both formally and informally. So tonight she's going to share with us her unique insights into the Australian government's approach to arbitrary detention um, and her current involvement in lobbying to reform both Australia's strategic response to this problem, but also the provision of support services to victims and their families. I'll be joining her in conversation afterwards, but please welcome Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me today. It's amazing to see so many people here. Um, I'm going to read this speech and then we're going to have a Q&A and I'd love to hear all of your questions and I'm open to answering anything whatsoever. So yeah, please have a think while, while I'm talking and we'll talk afterwards. In the official diplomatic language of most Western democracies, including our own, hostage diplomacy does not exist. It is a term which is only tacitly acknowledged in the corridors of power or privately to the families and loved ones of hostages. Despite this, however, it is a phrase which is growing in popularity in the media and among NGOs, campaigners and advocates. While governments might be reticent to call out the taking of hostages for diplomatic purposes, the truth is that not only is hostage diplomacy happening, it is on the rise. In many ways, hostage diplomacy is a neat and easily digestible expression of an ancient phenomenon the detention of foreign citizens as a tool of leverage in state-to-state -state relations. In our increasingly multipolar world, there is a clear link between growing challenges to the international rules-based order. 
and hostage taking as a diplomatic tool. The decline of Western dominance in the international sphere and the increasing brazenness of authoritarian states like China, Russia and Iran has meant that such states now perceive that the risks inherent in taking diplomatic hostages are likely minimal and far surpassed by the potential rewards. Western diplomats are loath to use the term hostage diplomacy for fear of offending their interlocutors in the state which is detaining their citizen. For sure, it is not a neutral term by any means. However, does our failure to call a spade a spade help us in any way to rescue innocent fellow citizens from the deep pit of despair that spade is engaged in digging? Does refusing to acknowledge the phenomenon make our adversary spades pause in the act of excavation or does it rather give them cover to burrow deeper still into the earth, building vaster dungeons to house yet more innocent people? Ladies and gentlemen, I put to you that on the issue of hostage diplomacy, we are weak. This weakness can be seen throughout the Western democracies and stems from a kind of naive and feeble delusion that, as history must advance inexorably forward in the direction of progress, our increasing inability to cajole or coerce the rest of the world into adhering to the international rules-based order that we set up must be merely a blip which will correct itself in time. Therefore, if we ask nicely enough, stating firmly that we have no intention of interfering in another country's judicial affairs, if we avoid outrage or provocation or consequences, maybe, just maybe, our hostage-taking adversary will stop their bad behaviour. Maybe countries which lack any rule of law to speak of or a free and independent judicial system will suddenly decide to be reasonable, enact a fair trial and let our innocent citizens return home. I don't need to tell you that this approach is clearly a fantasy and that belligerent authoritarian regimes like Iran's don't appreciate the nuances of such diplomatic niceties. They smell weakness. Our inability to punish or discourage hostage taking therefore acts as a perverse sort of incentive to such regimes. There are very few costs and a plethora of rewards to be gained by taking hostages. Hostage diplomacy pays dividends, and until we find a way to make it not be so, what was done to me and dozens upon dozens of other citizens of mostly Western democracies will continue with abandon and whenever the opportunity arises. What to do about hostage diplomacy is an especially tricky issue faced by those responsible for consular and foreign affairs in countries like Australia. I would argue that navigating this strategic minefield is a task beyond both the capabilities and the remit of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, as well as its international equivalents. Hostage diplomacy is only superficially a consular issue. At its core, it is a deeply political issue, and therefore it needs a political solution. A solution which requires creative, out-of-the-box thinking and political courage characteristics not usually associated with insular government bureaucracies. Tackling hostage diplomacy also requires a collaborative approach with input from a variety of branches of government, such as intelligence, defence, consular, foreign affairs, and even the judiciary, if a prisoner swap or some other legal change is needed. Government departments which zealously guard their turf and are often reluctant to work together must be forced to do so especially if the aim is to bring the hostage home quickly. On hostage diplomacy and arbitrary detention more broadly, Australia needs a clear and sensible strategy. Right now, we have none. This strategy should set out the approach we take when one of our citizens is detained by a state for purposes of diplomatic leverage. It should also determine our red lines in any negotiation over securing their release. Will we, for instance, green light the transfer of substantial sums of cash to the hostage-taking country, irrespective of international sanctions and the frightening human rights implications of such ransom payments. Both the UK and the US have done just this when Iran has taken their citizens hostage. The billions they transferred to the Iranian regime 
are now being used to shoot Iranian demonstrators in the streets for bravely exercising their right to peaceful protest. Is it okay to swap our prisoners for theirs, even if it means swapping innocent for guilty? How guilty is too guilty to be swapped? In my case, three convicted terrorists were released from prison in Thailand and allowed to return to Iran, where they received a hero's welcome. If these terrorists hadn't been incompetent morons and had actually killed people, would that have been a step too far? Belgium is currently debating swapping Asadullah Asadi, an Iranian diplomat who received 20 years in prison for smuggling bombs into Europe in his diplomatic bag and plotting to attack Iranian dissidents at a, Russell, at, a, at a rally in Brussels. This terrorist would be released in exchange for Olivier Van de Castille, an innocent foreign aid worker who has spent the past six months in brutal solitary confinement and was arrested, coincidentally of course just as Assadi's trial was wrapping up. Would freeing a would-be mass murderer be a bitter pill worth swallowing if it meant that Van der Castile would be allowed to return home to his distraught family? What about freeing the convicted war criminal Hamid Nouri, imprisoned in Sweden for his part in the massacre of thousands of political prisoners in the 1980s? Iran has taken several Swedish tourists hostage as a consequence. These delicate moral quandaries should be carefully weighed up by our elected representatives. And the hostages in question should not be left to suffer. They should not be left to suffer literally years of pain and torment until bureaucracies like DFAT decide to refer such decision making up to their political bosses. Clearly, there is enormous potential for international collaboration on this issue. Australia has signed up to Canada's Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention in State-to-State -state Relations, and we've e we even have our own Magnitsky Act, which could theoretically be used to target perpetrators. Sadly, however, like much in international law, the declaration is symbolic, non-binding, and therefore toothless. The UN Convention on Hostage-Taking does not cover state actors, and while the Canadian Declaration or the UN Convention could be adapted or expanded, there is no indication that such reforms are on the cards. Nor would it mean much if the authoritarian regimes which are actually engaged in hostage taking don't sign up. As for Magnitsky, so far Australia has declined to sanction anyone at all, except for a handful of Russians. Absent any meaningful progress on the international front, Australia should be developing its own standalone strategy on hostage diplomacy and arbitrary detention. The problem with leaving the management of state hostage-taking cases to DFAT consular, as they are currently, is that hostage diplomacy is not a consular issue. If someone is arrested, not because they committed a crime, or even suspected of doing so, but because they are an Australian citizen, this is not a matter of law and order at all. As I said earlier, it is a political matter, and it requires a political solution. I am therefore of the view that hostage diplomacy and arbitrary detention must be separated out from DFAT consular's caseload and treated as the separate phenomena they are. When our citizens are arrested because of the fact that they are our citizens, somebody needs to make a call as to what carrots and or sticks could be offered to get that person out as quickly as possible. Someone needs to communicate with the families of the detainees as well as receive information or intel from them, which can often flow both ways. Someone needs to liaise with the broad array of stakeholders whose input could be useful, from intelligence to defence to Australian embassies on the ground. Someone needs to lobby the politicians to sign off on a strategy which must be developed with creativity and flexible thinking. Most importantly, the buck must stop with someone who is both approachable and accountable Again, bureaucratic government departments are ill-suited to driving forward such tasks, which often require decisive action and a certain measure of risk-taking. In addition to developing a clear model for getting our citizens out of unjust detention in as swift and morally sound a fashion as possible, Australia also needs to think about how it communicates with the loved ones of current hostages and what it does with the hostages once they come home. On both points, 
our form has often been poor to say the least. Many are surprised to hear that DFAT can refuse to provide information to the distressed family members of Australian hostages until the hostage themselves sign a privacy waiver form. This bureaucratic catch-22 often persists for months as the Australian government usually does not have immediate access to the hostage in order to provide them with the form to sign. This is not only irrational, but causes real harm to family members who are already suffering immensely. In general, when interacting with hostage families, I believe the government could do with a bit more compassion as well as common sense. DFAT's consular operations are also highly secretive and marked by an almost paranoid aversion to engagement with media. Family members, whilst being told very little, are pressed into silence, using the very effective threat of, if you speak out or campaign for your loved one, you will endanger them in prison. This is often in the absence of any evidence or precedent of this being so. In the case of Iran, the fate of dozens of European and American hostages have received media coverage over the years, and there's not a single example of press attention leading to the hostages' punishment in prison. To the contrary, my example and that of others are testament that the opposite is often true. Public attention forces the hostage-taking state to actually treat the detainee better in prison, including improved access to medical treatment. There are certainly cases in which a public campaign would be detrimental to negotiating a hostage's release. However, intimidating families into staying quiet often results in the family eventually going AWOL and treading a path that could endanger negotiations in a much more meaningful way than had they maintained an open channel of communication with DFAT. For instance, a campaign calling on the Australian government to do more to free me from prison in Iran would have, have, would have been of little consequence to my Iranian captors. A campaign insulting the Iranian nation or abusing members of the Iranian judiciary would have gone down very differently. In today's interconnected, media-saturated environment, it is unrealistic to expect the loved ones of a hostage to keep quiet, particularly when coupled with a reticence to share detailed information with them in a more private capacity. One final area of policy, which I believe needs to be better engaged with, is reintegrating the detainee back into society once they arrive home. It shocks many people when I say, there was no procedure in place for when I got off the plane. I received no comprehensive medical exam, nor a psychiatric evaluation. There was no formal debriefing. No support services appeared to exist. I went straight into hotel quarantine and from there simply went on my way. Each returnee's needs would of course be different. A one size fits all approach would be unwise. We have, however, seen some cases of returned hostages failing to cope following their release back into Australian society. Recently, one former hostage returned to Afghanistan to celebrate the Taliban's takeover of the country with his former captors. What was going through his mind? Was this Stockholm Syndrome? What support, if any, did this former hostage receive following his years in brutal captivity? To be fair, what happens once a detainee returns home is not DFAT's purview. They are primarily concerned with what's happening outside the country, and once the hostage returns home, their job is done. The problem is, there doesn't seem to be anyone else to pick up the slack. We should also remember that DFAT has to deal with an average 40,000 consular cases a year, most of which involve Aussies dying or becoming sick or injured abroad, or even committing real and actual crimes. There are many excellent and dedicated employees in the department, but DFAT's caseload is ever increasing, and they lack the resources and funding to offer more than the most basic consular assistance in most cases. The United States has a model of best practice in this area. It's called the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. We need not adopt the US model whole scale, but we can adapt a similar envoy role to an Australian context. We could call this a commissioner or a special representative or even a task force. This person would ideally work with, but sit outside of DFAT and would be appointed by and report to the foreign minister of the day. 
they would be tasked with developing strategy for achieving the return of the hostage as expeditiously as possible. They would also assist in developing a broader policy, which acts to learn from past cases from, and from partner countries which face similar challenges, and act to disincentivise countries that do not respect the rules-based order from taking further hostages in the future. In the absence of international conventions or collective international action, Australia needs to be prepared to go it alone in tackling the scourge of hostage diplomacy, at least insofar as its own citizens are concerned. We need to be prepared to punish hostage-taking states, including making robust use of Magnitsky sanctions, without being perpetually hamstrung by fears of upsetting diplomatic relationships. After all, is not imprisoning innocent citizens of Australia for diplomatic leverage, not firing the first shot in an assault on our bilateral relationship? We should not be afraid of firing back. An Australian version of the American Special Presidential Envoy would act as a fulcrum to bring together and push forward the various levers of government whose input is necessary to bringing a hostage home. This person could coordinate with families and the media and could oversee the reintegration of the hostage once he or she arrives back in Australia. We will never be able to fully solve hostage diplomacy, but we can certainly do more to minimise its occurrence and we can certainly do better in our approach to assisting current hostages and their families. I call on the government to develop a standalone strategy and consider implementing a model similar to that of the US Special Presidential Envoy. DFAT and the government will continue to dither, buck pass and deflect until it stops being politically expedient for them to do so. I hope you will join me in demanding that greater attention be paid to this issue not only in the name of our fellow Australians currently unjustly imprisoned abroad, including Sean Turnell, who actually only hours ago received a three-year prison sentence in Myanmar, Chang Lei and Robert Pether, but also in the name of those who, cruelly and unimaginably and unfairly, we know will be next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kylie. That was that was fascinating, and I didn't realise that that, that had happened so recently with Sean Tunnell. That's very very upsetting. I was wondering if perhaps in our conversation we might be able to turn a little more to the issue of of academic freedom. You know, we're in a, in a university. You're an academic. And I, I, I wanted to discuss some of the issues that your experience raises for that. Um, and for scholars who want to continue to do research in authoritarian and conflict affected contexts. And so I'm wondering whether you think after everything that you've, you've been through that academic research should continue in Iran under the current regime. I mean, in other words, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is, is a better understanding of Iran's people, its culture, its politics, worth the risk that it potentially poses to researchers? And I guess the question more broadly would go to journalists as well. This is such a tricky question. I, like yourself, Sarah, I, you know, I was a fieldwork academic. I loved fieldwork. I believe and still do strongly in the value of fieldwork. If we become desk animals as academics and we just sit behind our screens and monitor from far away. There's so much we're missing out on. I don't think we can call ourselves experts at all if we never visit the, the countries or places in the world that we claim expertise in. So I cannot say that nobody should travel to Iran for research. Despite what happened to me, I, I still see the value in it. I would put a caveat on that by saying that we definitely need a more robust framework for assessing kinds of fieldwork research that is permitted in, in such places. We cannot remove all risk, however. If we were to say that any risky country in the world is off limits for research, we would probably have to strike off every country in the world other than the Western democracies. And think about what we would be missing if we weren't able to travel to vast swathes of Africa in the Middle East and Asia and South America and etc. There's always going to be a risk there 
And I think the analogy with journalism is a good one because we recognise as a society that having foreign correspondents, having journalists in the field is crucial. It's crucial to our ability to gather knowledge, process knowledge and understand what's going on in the world. And I think academics perform a very similar role. It's just less immediate. You know, you're not seeing the, the results on a nightly basis you know, on, on your TV or whatever, the TV news. But the gathering of research, it, it might take years instead of days, but it's still performing a, a crucial role for society. And I think perhaps universities need to be a little bit more like journalistic outfits and approach univer uh, academics traveling abroad to do research in the field in the same way that the ABC might approach sending a foreign correspondent out to the Middle East to, to report. And that is, there needs to be an understanding of the risk profile, there needs to be training around how to conduct oneself in, in such a location, and there needs to be on the ground contacts or, or people in place to help out in the event of an emergency. I think that's a that's a really good idea, and I'm you know I'm always thinking of the kinds of specifics because you know as as you know I, I have students who want to go and do this work as well, and I'm I'm afraid of the doors being closed to that opportunity. But I think you're right that we do need to have a more systematic way of thinking through risk and preparing researchers not only for the kinds of risks that you've been talking about, but but also for the ethical challenges that this can pose in in multiple directions as well. Do you, do you think that there are any specific safeguards that you can come up with that would have would have helped in your instance, or is is that just too you know, too much hindsight required for that question? I think definitely there's a lot of hindsight. It's very easy to look back and say sure. if only. But um, if there was some sort of training or understanding of what to do in an emergency if you get stuck or if you get into trouble. Mm. Um, whether that be some sort of government hotline, some sort of direct line to the Australian Embassy in Tehran, because actually the day before my arrest I went on the Embassy website, I wanted to give them a call because I was concerned and there was no phone number. That's interesting. So obviously they don't want all and sundry calling them up and getting in touch and getting spammed by random people or whatever, mm. but there was no way of contacting the embassy other than going down there physically in person and knocking on the door. And I've heard anecdotally you can't do that either because you don't, without an appointment they mm. won't let you in. That's right. So um, it's, it's very problematic. Mm. And if embassies aren't providing that, then perhaps universities need to think about providing that too. Um, mm. That if you, because sometimes you just get picked up without warning and it's terrible bad luck and there's nothing you can do. But often there would be some sort of signal or sign or you might have a suspicion mm. or something a few hours before or there might be the opportunity to ask for help and if it was easy to do that asking then you might save yourself from a very sticky situation. Absolutely and I think you're right thinking you know and it really comes through in your book you know when you when you go back as you say, in hindsight, you can put the breadcrumbs together to see how this came into being. And if there was some sort of a, a line that could be extended to people in you know, journalists, researchers to, to get some sort of quick access, I think that's, that's an interesting thing to pursue. Um, I've got a question here from an audience member that was offered up um, previously, asking something a little bit on, on a similar sort of tangent, but asking if there's anything in the ethics research approval process that you could have done or that could have been done by the universities um, to make research safer. My impression of applying for several ethics approval processes in my former life as an academic was that when assessing the risk profile of the project, the emphasis is very much on the participants or the subjects of the research rather than on the researcher themselves. And that is warranted, of course, because any research with human subjects, you know, you need to assess the ethical implications and, and et cetera for that, um, that subject. But there wasn't very much, if from what I can recall, about personal safety on a personal level of the researcher if they were going abroad or doing something that could result in a risky situation, um, even minimally. So, but, but at the end of the day, to be honest with you, my view of the ethics approval process is just a bureaucratic nightmare. It's a series of hoops you've got to jump through. Nobody cares. You've got some bureaucrat ticking boxes somewhere in the background. This person has no understanding of what your research is. Um, it's just someone in some central department somewhere. Um, the people on the committee that approve the, the projects, half of them are from science or from engineering or from some other faculty. Again, no real understanding. 
and um, it's you know I could think I can speak for a lot of my other fellow researchers who I knew at the time too that we just viewed it as an annoyance um, a series of forms we had to fill out. Nobody really takes it seriously because there's very little that bureaucratic form filling out can do to help you in a real life situation when you're in trouble abroad. And I think actually some sort of training or you know a, a short course that the university can offer all fieldwork academics who travel abroad, for instance, that would be much more useful than you know, an enhanced ethics approval process. Yeah, you're right. There is a, a very common complaint that the, the social sciences tend to be lumped in with the hard sciences in approval processes. So we spend a lot of time sort of going through the, the ways in which, you know, we're not going to medically harm the people that we interact with, but there's less uh, less sensitivity, I guess, in the issues that, that you're raising. And I think that's a, a really important cross-cutting point. Um, Another question that came up from an audience member earlier is whether you think that states that use hostage diplomacy, you've named a, f a few of them, are too big and too independent of Western democratic states for these countries, for, you know, for, for the West to be able to influence them in order to prevent hostage diplomacy. They wouldn't be taking hostages in the first place if they didn't want something. So if they were so big and, you know, if you're thinking of the biggest, it's probably China these days, right? We have two that we know of, Yang Hang Jun and Chang Lei, two Australians who are arbitrarily, arbitrarily detained in China. And um, this largely happened uh, to coincide with the souring of Australian-Chinese relations a few years ago. Uh, clearly, they want something or they're, they're sending a message by taking those people hostage. They want you to respond and react. They expect that. Same with Russia. Russia's holding several Americans. Um, you know, we, we have, you know, Iraq, Myanmar. They've got Australians too. North Korea's done this. Venezuela does this too. You know, some of those countries are not big, important movers and shakers, but they all want something from us. And that puts us in a difficult position, but it also gives us a little bit of leverage too, because we know that they don't care about that individual's life. They want something bigger. They want some financial concession, some political concession, or some prisoner exchange, something like that. Mm. So I do think they're not too big to influence in that sense, um, because they're kind of asking for a conversation with us by taking our people hostage. Um, but also Magnitsky sanctions are great because they are targeted on an individual level. So I don't think Australia or any other Western country is going to impose vast, you know, widespread countrywide sanctions on say China or Russia or even Iran because they've taken a couple of people hostage sadly you know I, I think that would never happen but we are able to pinpoint individual perpetrators within the system for instance I actually took part in a Magnitsky project last year that was international we were triangulating perpetrators um, people's identities across several countries in the world, people who'd been held hostage in Iran, trying to figure out the identities of some of these perpetrators. And the same guys would pop up every time. And we know some of their names. And we actually, I personally sent the names to the Australian government and asked that they consider sanctioning some of them under Magnitsky because that, that sends a very specific personal message to that perpetrator. In a way, it's a business model and you're targeting the people who are you know, running the business. And, um, you know, in the case of Iran, it was often the Revolutionary Guards, which aren't actually the, the legal formal Iranian government. They're a kind of a state within a state. So it, it's much more of a nuanced approach. And I think there is a lot of scope to use Magnitsky for these purposes to send a message as well. Okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. Thank you. I, I'm wondering maybe going just a little bit deeper on something you said um, before about how um, Australia could follow the US system a little more and how they offer services to, to hostages. I was speaking to a colleague of mine while I was away a couple of weeks ago who had also had the unfortunate experience of being detained abroad um, and was spoke very well of the way that the US managed not only his time in, in, um, in detention um, but the way that they interacted with his family and also the support that was provided to him once he was released for, for a number of years. Um, and I was wondering, you mentioned that you wouldn't want to, to follow that wholesale. Um, is there anything that you, that you think that, that we wouldn't want to follow in the way that the Americans are, are going about this? Or, I mean, some of the hostage family, the current families um, in the US have actually 
done quite an interesting thing. They've banded together and they've created a campaign group called Bring Our Families Home. And um, they have their own spokesperson, they have their own branding, um, they're having coordinated media campaigns. Um, they've just recently put together a mural in Washington DC, a mural on the wall, you know, on a public wall featuring the faces of their detained loved ones. And one of the reasons behind this is whilst they, they love the special, special presidential envoy and his office, and they think that his communication with them is excellent, they believe that there's a lack of willpower at the top in the, you know, the president's office to enact some of the strategies and, and ideas that the envoy comes up with. So they're trying to pressure the president and I his see. office. So, okay. you know, that would be their criticism that um, that individual, the, the envoy, is not empowered enough. Mm -hmm. But I think we'd probably see something similar emerge in Australia, okay. um, given the political dynamics. Yeah. Okay. I've just got one more question, and then we can hand it over to the audience for for questions. Um, but obviously, I, I follow you on Twitter um, <laughs> quite closely, um, and I've noticed that you've been calling out academics at Western universities who are trying to identify protesters in Iran and then rep have them reported to the IRGC. Um, and I wondered, do you think that the universities here or the, the government have a responsibility to respond to this behaviour? And if so, what do you think they might be able to do about it? Um, apologies to everyone for my ranting and raving on Twitter, if any of you are following me, especially right now. Um, but yes, um, it's actually quite shocking. You know, this particular individual Sarah mentions is based at Auckland Uni in New Zealand, actively on social media encouraging fellow Iranians to inform on one another and inform the besiege and the IRGC to have them arrested. This is a, a PhD student at an Australian, uh, at a New Zealand university. But also here in Australia, there is, I've seen evidence myself um, of one former head of the besiege of a major Iranian province was um, a PhD student at a major Australian university. And the besiege are the paramilitary groups on the streets shooting the protesters with live bullets right now. And this guy is at an Australian, was at an Australian university. We actually had the son of the Iranian parliamentary speaker, Khalibov, at an Australian university laundering money from you know ill-gotten corrupt money almost certainly from iran buying property in australia studying there um you know some of these and this is just iran i mean china is a whole nother kettle of fish in in that sense um i, I think universities have a responsibility when they're giving student placements or academic positions because some of these guys are actual academics too um when they're giving positions to assess who this person is and if there's a national security implication they need to inform the government and in the same vein our intelligence authorities need to be sharper about identifying some of these people if they are in Australia is it in our interest that they remain so are they informing because often and especially in the case of China but also anecdotally I've heard in the case of Iranian students here too some of these people are actively informing on their countrymen in Australia watching them seeing who's politically active sending info back to Iran we don't want that you know universities and governments have a responsibility to protect the freedom of speech and the rights of our students too so there needs to be more rooting out of some of these individuals and more consideration as to who we're giving visas to and whether also they're laundering funds and, and up to no good, you know, on our territory as well. Okay, thank you, Kylie. I think we might go to audience questions. If you're joining us online, you can ask your question in the box directly below the video, or you can also go to slido.com, as Fenella mentioned, S-L-I-D-O, and use the code Sydney Ideas. For those in the room, though, we've got two roving microphones. If anyone would like to ask a question of Kylie. Otherwise, I can keep going because I've got questions all evening. Plenty on Slido, yep. Um, good evening. Presumably you've had some interaction with DFAT with your thoughts and recommendations. Are you able to tell us a bit about that? Yes, I, I went down there a few months after my release and had a very good, robust chat with them in Canberra. Um, unfortunately, I don't think any of my ideas were listened to because I've seen the same mistakes repeated with others who've since come back after me, including one in May of this year who received no help or treatment or, or support whatsoever 
and um, wasn't even aware that, that anything was out there or possible, which broke my heart because I've had several conversations with them and I've been told it would be taken on board. But I, I'm not blaming them on an individual level. I think the individuals within DFAT do care and there are some great people who, on a personal level, go above and beyond and really want to help. It's just sort of institutional culture, the constant changing of staff as well. People shift positions all the time and I think a lot of the knowledge isn't retained and every few years, you know, the system gets cleaned out, new people come up and everything starts from scratch again, which is why I think we need a, a formal strategy and someone with whom the buck stops because unfortunately there's no one individual within DFAT responsible for arbitrary detention. There's a kidnapping section, but that's much more broad and it deals with sort of non-state actors and mafia groups and criminal gangs and all these kinds of things, which is much more clear-cut law and order rather than a diplomatic issue. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to blame them too much. I think they do do a good job at what they do. But unfortunately, I think having a standalone strategy in this area would ensure that other people don't fall through the cracks in the future. Thank you. I've got a question online from Diane who's asking, as a young female PhD student doing field work in conflict zones in Central Asia and the Caucasus, do you have any specific suggestions for her to take proactive safety protocols? My specific suggestion would be find the mobile number of somebody who works in the embassy of whatever country you're going to whether that be trying to do so via formal official means, I don't know if they'd give it to you, but informally, often you can find a contact of a contact or somebody you know who works in the embassy, try and get some sort of direct line um, and have that in your phone when you go there. So if anything goes wrong um, in a split second, you can try and pick up the phone. I think that would have been really useful to me had I have had that in Iran. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. If I could add to that, before I go away, I have a list of phone numbers that I leave to my husband of this, you know, if it goes bad, this is the first person. And it's always, I have people in the country who I know will be seeing me regularly, which I guess if you've not visited the country is a little harder to do. But I would say before you go, try to build rapport with people who are already on the ground and who have a good understanding of the, of the local security situation. And as you say, give their phone numbers to loved ones at home and make sure you've got that sword in your, in your own phone as well. Just looking to see if there's any questions from the audience. Kylie, thank you for all the advocacy work that you're doing. Uh, you, your book was incredible and for those who haven't read it, I strongly recommend reading it. Uh, but it made me very curious to know how you reflect on the role of academia in advocacy, first of all. Uh, recognise that you, you, you're now an ex-academic, but how do you reflect on that? And also, what, how are you going now and what's your focus now, apart from the obvious advocacy work that you're doing? Thank you for your lovely comments. Um, you know, I think academia you know it's a behemoth we have corporate university structures now it's it's very easy to lose sight of the individual and as academics and as universities we need to remember that human rights academic freedom freedom of speech some of these values should be core tenets of our identity and are often professed to be our values but we need to make sure that it's more than words it's also action and um I'm very heartened to see, for example, Sciences Po, um, which is sort of the premier international studies institution in Paris, France. Um, they, their activism for their colleague, Dr. Fariba Adelkha, who was an anthropologist in Iran um, and was in the cell down the hall from me for a while in Evin Prison. She's still there in Evin Prison today. They, their campaign for their colleague has been astounding and it's coming from the institution as well as her individual friends and colleagues in her department you know even touring around Europe with research symposia and, and conferences in her name but also valuing her research work and then drawing others in and, and, and discussing what can be done um, and, and active campaigning online and etc too and you know that I thought was a fantastic model I mean uh, colleagues should be free to speak in favour of, you know, other colleagues and just as, again, journalism is an interesting 
uh, example because if you look at how journalists rally behind one another when a journalist is unjustly imprisoned, you know, we should be doing the same when an academic's unjustly imprisoned, I think. Um, and I know on an individual level a lot of people do do that and I very much pay tribute to my amazing colleagues at various universities and Sarah's one of them of course um, throughout Australia who, who campaigned for me when I was in prison um, because that was invaluable and um, yeah I can't thank them enough for that and I'm doing well thank you for asking. <laughs> um, yeah I'm, I'm quite busy these days travelling around doing things but um, yeah hopefully it'll settle down soon and I'll, I'll have a break. <laughs> I think you'll deserve one. You, you're obviously you're travelling at a at a constant pace. It's been very hard oh. to get a, a date that worked for you. So we're oh, very yes. lucky to to have you here. Um, one more question from uh, from the audience online before I take another one from uh, from the audience here. Um, I guess a question sort of going a little further down what you were just talking about, a, a more personal question from from Margaret. What kept you going while you were locked up in Iran? That's really hard to answer. Um, for me, the friendships and the solidarity of my fellow inmates was what kept me going. Once I'd made friends first kind of illicitly through secret communications with some of the women next door in the cell next to me or down the hall in the cell through note passing, sort of conversations in air conditioning vents. And then when I was put together with some of them in a cell, and you know, I dedicate the book to Nilufar Bayani and Sipide Kashani, two of the uh, two environmental conservationists who are still in prison to this day as innocent women, um, part of a larger group. You know, these friendships and this solidarity that I formed with some of these remarkable Iranian women, and we see, you know, their courage and their just their bravery on the streets today with what's coming out of Iran. I mean, this remarkable spirit that of my fellow prisoners that I saw firsthand in prison, I think more than anything else, that's what got me through. And that comes through so powerfully in your book, it really does. I, I felt like I knew these women and wanted them to be my friends as well. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a beautiful portrayal of the, the ways that you supported one another in most terrible of, of circumstances. Um, a question up there in the back? Thank you. It's great. Congratulations on the book. It gave wonderful insights, not just into your own circumstances, but into what it really is like to live day to day in Iran, in a part of the world we know little about. My question is completely different, though. Um, I read that you are initiating legal action against the president of Iran. Now, unfortunately, I don't think you'll get anywhere because one of the strongest principles in international law is head of state immunity, um, both as a sitting head of state and as a sitting head of state visiting for an official United Nations function. I simply don't think you'll even get um, into court. Um, but perhaps you could tell us about the thinking behind the, the legal action and because obviously you, you, you're aware of what I just said, but what would what would be you be hoping to achieve from it, and why, or what was your motive for this action? That's an excellent question. So, sort of, the way I see it is, it's a bit of a stunt. It's not serious. Well, I mean, I, don't, I shouldn't say that because it, I'm a plaintiff in this, but I'm not the only one. There's a group of people, and the the action had been put together by Nufti, um, which is an Iranian American pro-democracy lobby group and the Atlantic Council's strategic litigation project. And, um, you know, I didn't necessarily expect anything to come of it other than drawing attention or showing the world President Raisi is a very nasty guy, he's a war criminal, he's got blood in his hands, he was the head of ju judiciary during my incarceration, therefore he's responsible for my sham trial, uh, psychological torture and everything that happened to me in prison. Um, we were suing him under the torture statutes in the US as a criminal case. So we did submit the documents in, in court in New York a couple of weeks ago. The court accepted the, the suit as far as I'm aware. Um, we were, they were, I mean, I say we, I didn't do anything. I'm sitting here in Australia, you know, those remarkable people in New York um, attempted to serve the papers on Racy's delegation. I don't know what happened with that. My assumption is they probably didn't succeed. But um, it was, and there was a second uh, suit against Racy as well by another group. So 
basically the Iranian American community, a lot of them had been campaigning for his visa to be denied, which is also very difficult when he's you know, a head of state visiting the UNGA. Um, there were a couple of people in his delegation who were also sanctioned, who, whose visas very sh clearly should have been denied, um, but weren't. And um, when that wasn't possible, they started to think of other strategies. How do we draw attention to this guy? You know, he was a hanging judge. He's called on, on one of these death commissions in 1988 that saw thousands of political prisoners be executed in, in prison without any due process and he was actually a judge on one of those commissions sending people to their death. So this is a, a war criminal um, and a very nasty character and we wanted to draw attention to that. But I, I actually have no expectation of any real legal result coming from that suit. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you, Carly. Um, I must admit, I haven't read your book, but I was wondering whether you can give us a bit of an insight in what your contact was with the outside world and how much you were aware, either through individual contacts with your family or through DFAT, um, of the attention that your case received in Australia and internationally. Um, I would imagine you had no radio computer or anything like that that gave you access to the outside world so you must have been relying on on whatever sporadic contacts that you had with people from the outside world yeah that's a good question i i didn't know very much at all i um i was banned from consular assistance for about nine or ten months as a punishment so i had zero contact and banned from family phone calls as well at the same time so no contact with anyone for a sizable chunk um, throughout all of my court trial, sentencing, verdict, everything, I had no contact with anyone. Um, about 10 months before my release, that was reinstated, uh, but it was very sporadic and unpredictable. There were certain moments where I could call my family quite routinely, but we weren't really allowed to discuss my case or anything like that over the phone. Um, and I saw the embassy representatives sporadically as well in that sort of last 10 months before my release. They sometimes gave me some indication. I found out that my case had been made public and it only became public 12 months after my arrest. So for the first 12 months, nobody knew I was in Iran and I just disappeared off the face of the earth and my, my friends didn't know what happened to me. They thought I just ghosted them, you know. Nobody knew what happened. And other than my, my close family. And um, actually my cellmate, Nilufar, she was, I was banned from family phone calls, but she had a family phone call once a week for five minutes and was taken outside to the payphone and her family said to her, we're watching the Iranian dissident, you know, satellite TV channels. Your cellmate, that Australian girl, is all over the news and she's on the BBC as well, you know, and they, so it was her, her family that told her and then she came back into my cell and told me, Kylie, you know, everyone knows about you now. So... Um, yeah, it was a very kind of drip feed, sporadic um, amount of information that came through and I honestly had no idea of the scale or the extent of it at all and I was quite shocked when I finally got out and, and, and learnt that so many people who I knew but also remarkably complete strangers who I'd never met had been campaigning for me and who cared about me and, you know, cared what happened to me and, and that was just incredible and, and I wish that when I was in prison I had, a, had have known because it would have made such a difference to my mental state. But yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful for that and um, yeah, for me it was remarkable. Boy, it's good to have you home. I'm oh, thrilled to be sitting you. here on the, on the stage <laughs> with you. And I think we can bring this evening to a close. I would like to thank you so much for making the time to come and speak to us all here at Sydney University. I would like to thank the audience both here in front of me and online um, for joining tonight's Sydney Ideas event and the Michael Hinsey Lecture for 2022. Thank you to everyone who worked behind the team. There's a lot of people behind the, behind the scenes, as many of them dotted around the room from Sydney Ideas, from the CIS and all of the crew. Uh, the podcast and the video is going to be available on demand shortly. Um, you can find that at the Sydney Ideas website and you'll be able to find out about coming events there as well. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Kylie. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody.